Hey, what's up guys? Pablo Munoz here. Welcome back to another video tutorial. Today I'm going to show you how to take a concept or a sketch that looks very, very rough inside ZBrush and rendering it in Marmoset Toolback 4. Now, the key of this workflow is that you don't have to worry about any technicality of optimizing the mesh, retopologizing it, uh, not even UVs. Um, that's the key of the, of the process. So we will be able to take a very rough concept or a sketch, like I said, like a DynaMesh object, uh, even fiber mesh, and move that into Marmoset where we can play around with the lighting, camera, um, everything that uh, 3D has to offer. So let's go ahead and jump straight into it. All right, so here we are in ZBrush, and this is the sketch that we're going to be working on. Uh, this tutorial is going to be divided in two parts. The first one is all about the, the concepting, designing, sketching, uh, pretty much showing you some of the techniques that I use to create uh, this, this creature. And, you know, it's very sketchy, but uh, I want to give you some of the, the tools and the, and the workflows to create something similar. Uh, the second part of the tutorial is going to be about the ZBrush Compositor, uh, which is essentially taking this sketch or this uh, ZBrush sculpture and taking it to a renderer. So we're going to focus on Marmoset Toolback 4 in this case, and we're going to use the ZBrush Compositor. The ZBrush Compositor is this one right here. I'm going to actually open this one up. And... It would be this one right here. Okay, so this is a an official plugin, and it's something that I developed with Joseph Dross a few years ago, and it's still very relevant. It's something that I use almost on a daily basis if I want to create a quick concept or a quick sketch that um, I want to basically bring it to a, a a high quality level. So yeah, this is going to be the Sirius Compositors. We're going to be using this. So if you don't see it in your C plugin palette, you can go ahead and download it from the Pixelogic Download Center. It's called ZBrush Compositor. It's free, uh, but that's the one that we're going to use. All right, so let's go ahead and jump into the first part of the tutorial, uh, which is, again, about sculpting. <laughs> All right, so let me just go ahead and show you kind of like the, the quick process of how I got to this stage, because I want to reiterate something. This process is for sketches or for uh, for quick concepts. Uh, you can totally use it for a more polished piece, but it is a really useful process if you just want to create a quick sketch. Let me just show you the, the wireframe of this so that you can see. Uh, I'm going to go into solo mode so with this uh, with this subtool here. Uh, by the way, I have uh, multiple subtools in this case. And I'm going to enable polyframe so you can see maybe. Yeah, let's get closer here. So you see, this is just a, a dynamesh sketch with a bunch of polygroups. Those are polygroups from um, the process that I use, which I'm going to show you. Uh, but yeah, this has like 4.7 million polygons. So it's pretty high. Uh, and I'm not going to optimize or anything like that. I'm just going to you know, send it to um, to the compositor. And you'll see what I mean in, in the second part of the tutorial. All right, so um, the way that I started this was like this, just with a sphere. So I have the undo history, so I'm gonna show you kind of like step-by-step -step all the different subtools. So let me just move you forward to something like this. So up to this point, it's just basically using the move brush to essentially pull and push things around just to, um, establish the main shape and that's going to be the basis of that kind of like the skull right it's nothing like super accurate but i'm just trying to define the primary shapes let's go ahead and move forward so now at this point i started adding some uh, volume with the clay builder brush so this one right here these strokes is is done with the clay build up uh tubes or clay tubes sorry uh this one this one right here so the clay tubes that gives you um, a slighter flatter surface it doesn't build volume as fast but it, it creates like these uh, crevices that you can um you can capitalize on and you can just define more things using this brush so yeah that's pretty much it this is still a dynamic object and at this point i just went ahead and extruded you'll probably see it there so i went ahead and masked this area right and this area is going to turn into into this okay um and the way that i did that and if I go back to this to this guy, uh, you can go to the extract sub palette or section in the sub tool sub palette, and you can define the thickness and click in extract. And if you like it, click on accept. And that's essentially what I did. So that's what the the masking is in here. So let's just jump into the other sub tool. So this is the the result of that extracting process. And I just went ahead and turned it into a dynamic object so that I can you know edit it a little bit more um, freely. So let's just move forward. So again, all of this is just move brush trying to establish the, you know, the primary shape, the volume, pretty much what I want this piece to be. Oh, let's go back here. 
and let's get out of Solomon. So it's kind of like a like a skull within a skull type of thing, but the, everything is kind of blended together. That's the design or the idea that I have. Um, so at this point, I went ahead and used the snake hook brush. And you'll see when you first select this snake hook brush, it tells you that it works better with Sculptress Pro. So you can click OK um, and just go ahead and enable Sculptress Pro from here. And for those of you who might not know about Sculptress Pro, is basically uh, a tool that allows you to pull and move things around. And ZBrush is going to automatically recreate the topology around it. So I'm not going to use it right now because I don't want to alter the, the timeline. But essentially, with this tool, I went ahead and start pulling this area. So this is what the snake hook brush does. Okay. So at this point, that's um that's, that's the process. Very very straightforward, and you see very sketchy. I don't I don't spend too much time at this stage on you know defining uh, things too thoroughly or adding too much details. It's just to get the bases right before I start sculpting or or you know even tweaking things. Then I went ahead and used the curved tube brush. This one right here. Um. And let me just show you what I did. So I started adding these tubes. And this is essentially the process of adding kind of like pieces of clay. If you're working with a more traditional, um, you know, traditional clay, <laughs> you can use this approach to add these tubes around and then you can merge everything together. The only thing that you might notice is that these, um, this tube has like a tapering effect at the top and bottom, which is not the default behavior of this brush. So what you can do is go to the stroke palette and enable this size and this will enable this profile curve uh, so i think by default if i reset it it looks something like like this uh, i can't remember exactly but basically what you can do is tweak these points um, you can click anywhere to add another one and this is pretty much the profile that i created to generate this um, this style so let me just show you all the ones i did uh, and by the way i'm also using symmetry so all of these added tubes are symmetrical so up to this point so all of those intricate details that you see kind of like in the in the more polished sketch version um the the result of blending all of these tubes right so all of these tubes they have um polygroups at this point and i have them merge them together but that's the next step so once i added these these initial volumes i went ahead and dynamesh the whole thing Right? And Dynamesh, what it does is it merges everything together again. I have to get closer here so you can see. So now these are not um, individual pieces. Let me just go back and show you. So right now you'll see they're kind of like overlapping. They're individual pieces. Once I redynamesh everything, they are blended together. And of course, I use this smooth brush to, yeah, to, to soften the transitions. Let's move forward. Okay. These are just like sculpting tools. Uh, I'm gonna use a custom brush, but let me just show you a few other pieces or a few other uh, subtools. So uh, the next one would be this one right here. I'm gonna move forward a little bit. So basically what I did with this was to bring in again the, the tubes or the curved tubes and creating these um, it's it's not like drapery <laughs> in my in my head. What I wanted to create is kind of like a transition between you know like a hard bone part of the skull into something a bit softer like cartilage or something like that. Uh, but then at the end, I just make these um, these tubes that are kind of like hanging from the from the creature. Um, it will make sense <laughs> later, a bit later. But basically, yeah, just more of the same. It's just a, a different subtle so that I can have more control over this and. There we go. So that's that's almost. Let me just get back, get into solo mode. So this is almost what um what the block out of this this part looks like. Just a bunch of tubes hanging, um and because I wanted to make it feel a little bit more realistic in the in the way that these uh, tubes will behave, I went ahead and masked them all at the top, like you see here. So I'm just masking those here at the top. Um and with this mask, I went into the dynamics palette and I simulated this. So Let's just go forward. So this is after the simulation. Of course, the undo history doesn't record that simulation, but all I did was go into this dynamic palette and run the simulation. And that's it. Because I had this mask, the, the entire set of tubes is not going to fall. It's just going to uh, stay there at least. Yeah, it's kind of like pinning these areas. All right. Uh, the rest is just the move brush. Let's go back in here. So I'm using the move brush to adjust things. Gonna go forward all the way up to this point. 
right? So um, you'll see that there is like a collision here with the ground. And so I just went ahead and clipped this or, or cut it with the knife curve brush. And I also changed this to a Dynamesh object. Now, one thing that is pretty cool with the Dynamesh, you can enable these uh, groups here in Dynamesh before you do it, obviously. And because you have the polygroups, right? All of these different polygon IDs, um, ZBrush is going to keep them separately. So this is what I did. If I go forward, I obviously cut that using the, the knife cut, this one right here. So once I Dynamesh this object, you see it is a new topology, a new Dynamesh object, but uh, ZBrush kept all of those, um, those groups because that's what I enabled. Um, also, I went with the inflate brush and added a bit of thickness and maybe up to here. And I'll show you how I go to those details in a second. All right. So um, another cool trick or another cool thing that I did for the um, kind of like the drapery is uh, this bit here. So uh, all I did was create a plane 3D and I stretch it in the X axis. And then using the select lasso or the select rectangular piece, I just deleted kind of like some gaps. Um, and that will create these, these lines, right? So again, the same thing. I use the Dynamics palette to run the simulation. And this is what I got after running that simulation. If I move a little bit forward, um, you'll see it's a little bit smoother. And that is just turning on Dynamics. For most of you guys, would be on the Geometry, uh, <laughs> Dynamics of Division, Dynamic. I also added thickness as you can see here so now this has thickness I'm just going to move forward a little bit faster um, the way that i remove this harsh uh, transition to to this one is just simply by going to the um to the crease tab and i clicked on on crease all so that there's no creasing anywhere and i also switch the post subdivision slider here or sorry not the slider the switch this one right here uh, to create that smooth surface all right, so with this dynamic subdivision, like kind of like the preview, I went ahead with the move brush and adjusted things around. All right, just gonna move forward a little bit more. Um, and at this point, this is still this still is a, a single-sided mesh, right? If I turn off dynamic, you see it is just a single-sided mesh. Maybe turn on double so you can see. Uh, but what I did. After that was to apply this dynamic subdivision. And let's go ahead and do the same thing here. So this is a, another one, <laughs> basically a duplicate of the first one that I, I duplicated before I run the simulation just to run it on top of it. So pretty much the same thing. It's just a, a duplicate. Um, let's, let's go back here a little bit. All right, so this is the, the blocking of, um, of the creature. So after that, let me, oh, one more, sorry. This is the, this is the same thing, uh, just with a full plane. So well, a slightly larger plane simulated. There we go. Um, I use the masking brush as well here to, uh, to pin this area to the top and then simulate the rest and then use the, the same tools that I just showed you, the move brush, then dynamic subdivision, all of that um, before this one. Okay, so this would be kind of like the, the block out, right? Um, and in order to add those details that, that you saw kind of like in this version, right? All of that, this is done um, not even with patience. <laughs> I did that relatively quickly with a custom brush or a, or a set of custom brushes from my Geiger pack. So I'll show you what um, that looks like. Basically, if I go into this tool, uh, the one with the, the basic skull, let's go ahead and move forward. All of these setup, all of these, um, you know, volumes are done with a with a specific brush called the um, the standard strong, and this comes from the Geiger and Beksinski pack. So it's just a, a stronger version of the of the standard brush, um, with some additional tweaks. But you could do the same thing with just a stronger version of the standard brush. Um, these ones right here, these cuts, these are essentially the um, another <laughs> another brush which is this one, the HR Geiger Cutter. And again, you can achieve similar results with something like the Dam Standard Brush, for example, that comes with ZBrush or the Slash 3. Uh, slash 3, this one. So that gives you a similar result. This one has a, a stronger um, effect and a pinch effect. So that's what I did. Oops, uh, let me go back a bit. 
So uh, to add kind of like a neck or something to so that it's not a, like a floating head, I just mask an area and extrude that. Right, this is just using the Gizmo 3D and then dynamesh the whole thing again, just to give it a bit of a of a neck. But as you can see, this is pretty um, sketchy, right? Like there's no there's there's nothing very well defined. Everything is very um, quick <laughs> in a way. So I'm gonna go forward. All right, so these details right here that I'm gonna show you, these ones are done with another brush. That brush would be this one, the Membrane Builder Connected. Um, so yeah, this is just to create this quick, kind of like um, interconnected membrane uh, with holes that then I can just refine. Same thing for, for the sides, that's what I use in there. Um, for these additional details that you see here, I used another one called the uh, the Rock Brain Stuff. Is giving you these bumps at the same time that it cuts through the model um, with a with a strong line in the middle of the bumps. So that would be the line right here and the bumps around it. Then I use another brush for these details right here, and this is just to emulate kind of like a um, like a porosity of the of the bone surface maybe, and that is done with another brush called the Pattern Nine and also Pattern Six. So I use these two uh, brushes to add all of these details. So you see they're, they're pretty much single strokes to add a bunch of details in one go. Uh, for the ones inside the, the eyes, I use another one called the Membrane 2. Um, and this one is pretty cool. I use it for a lot of different effects and it just creates a, a nice kind of like interconnected pattern um, that works really well in lots of cases. Uh, the rest is just like more manual uh, fixing or more manual tweaking with the the Geiger cutter, or the equivalent would be dam standard brush. A little bit of move brush. And just before we get into polypaint, let me just bring the other ones to the same level. Um, the same thing here, one trick or one thing that I can um, tell you that you can use in this case is because we have a lot of like really thin surface. So if I were to use any of those brushes, it will destroy the back of the, you know, the inside. So all you need to do is really like if you're using any of these brushes or something similar, uh, you can just select them and you can go to the brush palette, go to auto masking with the brush selected and make sure that you have the back face uh, mask enabled. So by default, it should be off and this is not a global setting. So it should be enabled or disabled per, on a per brush basis. Uh, so yeah, this should be like this. You can just enable it. And now uh, Sirius will respect whatever is behind the course or behind the brush. So that's how I went ahead and added those details here. Uh, a lot of move brush as well, just to, to the, um, just to alter the main shapes. All right, here we go. This one is pretty heavy. It's almost like 5 million polygons. Okay. Oops. Let's go up to, up to here. All right, let's get out of Solomon. So you see, uh, these tools, the, the main two that form the head, that's, that's pretty much all there is to it. Uh, for these tubes though, um, I use the same technique. So I just added a bit of detail, like you see here. Uh, but then I went ahead and smoothed everything out using the, the smooth peaks, this one right here. So the smooth peaks that comes with ZBrush as well, um, allows you to smooth all the details, but it will keep some of the, the crevices. So that's how you can achieve like that bony surface almost. So I just went ahead and did that it randomly throughout. Um, all right. And I think this one's done. This one is done. I think I made a mistake and, and changed the timeline on this one, but I'll show you in the final, not a big deal. Um, all right. So for some of the details here of the kind of like the weaving pattern or the woven pattern that is in this one. Oh, I also made a mistake on that one. <laughs> doesn't matter. So th what I did was, um, I went to the surface tab, this one right here, click on noise. And because this was originally a, uh, a plane, right? It had already some UVs. Uh, all I did was just, you know, distort that plane and then gave it thickness. So it should come with UVs. If it doesn't have UVs, you can run a quick UV master process and get UVs. Uh, but basically if you click on UVs, um, you can click on the noise plug and that should bring in a new window. Let me just bring this in. So this window, and all I did was change these from checkerboard to width. And I use the defaults, click on okay. 
and you won't see it straight away so you have to tweak a few things i'm going to uh, change this mix basic noise to zero and increase the strength maybe turning off this the switch and also scaling the plugin down a bit let's make it positive values all right something like that right so this is the the plugin working and it's nicely distributed across the entire plane uh, because it's using the the uvs so there's no projection it's just literally using the uvs of that simple plane um, and then you can use this mix basic noise so that it mixes with the with the basic noise just to add a bit of uh, variation if you want to and if you're using color you can also blend with color so let's click okay that's kind of like what i did for that um, but yeah in terms of detailing that's pretty much it so let's go ahead and move on into like a bit of polypin just to show you the the process as well as to how i got to um to this which again is pretty simple and and you see and this is what i meant about uh the the pieces of bone kind of like <laughs> flapping um flapping away i don't know it's it, i don't know exactly what this could be again it's just a quick concept and this is precisely why i want to show you this process because this is something that you can do relatively quickly in an hour or something um or less once you get the, the hang of it and then you can produce multiple versions of these things uh, or these concepts um, and then decide which one to go for so that you don't waste a lot of time so again this is kind of like a proof of concept more than anything all right let's go ahead jump into the solo mode you'll see it's pretty pretty basic if i go oops let's go back to the other one sorry this is the one that has the undo history let me actually just show you um, step by step this will be the same process for the rest of the tools anyway so i'm gonna fill it with a white color all right i'm gonna select a standard brush and i'm gonna disable the lazy mouse pressing l or i have it here in my ui you you should find that in the stroke palette lazy mouse turn that off i'm gonna turn off z add which um, if you're using the default ui this z add should be somewhere in at the top otherwise would be under the draw palette z add and let's enable rgb as well okay so now this brush the standard brush becomes a painting brush um so yeah we can just paint with this brush with obviously a color like this so um i selected a base color click on fill object maybe darker one like so so now this is the the entire mesh is filled with this color um, and then you can use masking tools or anything you want just to um to add variation so i would probably just start with maybe a darker color the back like so and just picking up some of the the colors that i've already established maybe a little bit of blue just to variate it and then use the uh, the blending of whatever color i add just to change it a little bit uh, to get into the crevices you can do a few things uh, you can use this compute which essentially is the ambient occlusion uh, plugin i'm going to click compute and see we're going to analyze the surface and create like a, a, an ambient occlusion like a ray trace ambient occlusion based on these uh, on the volumes of this mesh um, and this is super useful I'm, i use this all the time when i'm doing uh, polypane since they introduced this tool so you'll see it just basically creates a mask right and i can invert that mask right uh, just holding control click and clicking on the canvas really and i'm just going to hide it go into the masking and i'm going to hide it so that you can see what i'm doing let's turn on polyframe again all right so i'm going to select a dark uh, dark color maybe something based on this yellow right um, and you can do this manually since we already have the mask i can just go ahead and do this right maybe that's too much or you can just fill object and it will just fill those um on mask areas in this case based on the ambient occlusion with whatever color all right that's pretty much it i'm gonna clear that mask um you can also use something like this ma uh, this mask smoothness that will mask automatically certain areas and of course you can tweak the range of that smoothness mask like that and again you can just hide the mask and use a similar color maybe lighter color like so and that way you generate this um, variation on color so uh, you can play around with this for the most part i use the uh, mas mask by smoothness or mask peaks, peaks and valleys uh, and those ones are pretty good to generate this this variation uh, once you finish as once you finish playing around with this you can clear the mask and then you can add a bit more of manual work so for instance getting closer here maybe add a different color and then just blend 
things a little bit more but I'm not gonna spend too much time on, on this one. Like I said, this is a, a quick concept uh, and this is exactly the same process that I use for the rest of the subtools. You see pretty much the same thing. And that's it. So this is the end of part one of this tutorial. So the next part is going to be how to take this mesh and without doing any cleanup or without doing any further UEs or retopology or anything like that, being able to achieve something like this. So this is Marmoset tool back for um, and you see it's a it's a pretty decent you know render for a for a sketch <laughs> uh, and I can just take advantage of the lighting you know light position all of that so I'm just rotating the the environment for this creature um, you know we can make it metallic if we wanted to right so this is like super cool and really easy so this is what the serious compositor does uh, the serious compositor is something that um, like I said I came up with kind of like the, the workflow, just as an experiment. Um, and I collaborated with Joseph, uh, Joseph Dross when he was working at Pistologic and we managed to, uh, to automate the process into two specific software. So one of them is um, Marmoset Toolback 4 and the other one is Substance Painter, uh, Substance 3D Painter from Adobe. And this one is kind of like my favorite. It just allows me to play around with the with you know tools like lighting and uh, material properties really really quickly. But if you want, you can use that for uh, a 3D painter, like I said, and then play around with all the generators and you know tools like that. So I might do another video in the future um, just covering that part. But we're gonna focus on this software to get it to this point. Okay, so, so let me go back here into Zbrush. Cool. So the, the way that this works is literally one single button, but there's a couple of things uh, in terms of the setup that I want to mention. So let's go ahead and bring in the C plugin. And I have that installed already. Zbrush Compositor. So if I just go ahead and click on Create Toolback Composite, um, you will get this, this pop-up. And this process will generate the passes, blah, blah, blah. OK. Uh, just make sure that Marble Set is installed. Click OK. Uh, I'm just going to cancel because I already have it open, but this is what I wanted to show you. So uh, you will get this pop-up saying that the canvas or the, the document is not a square document. You don't have to do it, but it's recommended that you set the, the, the square format yourself so that um, you achieve the, you know, an optimal composite basically, or a composition that you want. So I'm going to cancel this and I'm going to show you what that means. Um, let's go ahead and change the background to you know, just a yellow so, so you can see what this is. And I'm going to go to the document, which I have here in my UI. Um, let's just do it from the palette, actually. So let's go to, let's click on this pro, which is the constraint proportions. And I'm going to set this to, um, it doesn't matter. Let's do 1000 by 1000. Okay. It doesn't matter what you use here. This is just to, to be able to make sure that the height and the width are, are exactly the same thing uh, because at the end, the series compositor is going to override these details and it's going to give you the resolution that, um, that we need. So let's just resize that. Uh, yes, I'm going to resize that. Control N to clear the canvas. Drag my creature in there as well. And I'm just going to click on A A half so that you can see the full composition. All right. So this is important because this is ultimately what the Zbrush Compositor does. It just takes a bunch of screenshots based on what you have in the canvas with different materials, and it sets them all up in Marmoset. And the same thing happens for um, Substance Painter. And you see you have two buttons, one for a tool bag and one for a Substance Painter. All right, so I'm going to get closer here. All right. And let's say this is, this is going to be the, it's not crop. That area. All right, so this is going to be the, the render, and this is what I want to use as my composite to, to produce that render. Okay, let me just go back to Marmoset again, and you'll notice I'm going to walk you through this. I just want to show you something else, um, you know, just because it is that, that's kind of like the cool part, and I'll show you how to set it up. Um, and one of the reasons I like this process is because it allows me to play with 3D uh, tools. I seen like a 3D render, right? So if I change the sky, you can do fun things like this, just adding some glowing beats and a highlight in there, uh, change the, you know, the, the backlighting and all of that. Uh, but anyway, I'm just going to close this app and show you how to set it up. Just wanted to show you the, the test that I had in here. Okay. All right. So I'm going to close this now. Um, no, don't want to save. All right. So now Marmoset is, um, is closed. 
So let's go ahead and choose the resolution that we want for the compositor. Uh, I'm going to choose 2K or 2048, but you can just go for higher numbers. I think this one is pretty, pretty decent for a concept anyway. And I'm going to click on Create Toolbot Composite. Uh, what you have here in this area, this is just for, uh, for, uh, for additional things. All right, so let's go ahead and choose the resolution. So I'm going to keep it as 2048. And before I click on Create Composite, I'm going to check this, um, this other area. So this reset path, uh, this is just to indicate where the, you know, the application is in case you change computers or, or change uh, hard drives or whatever, you can just reset it here. Um, the first time that you use this or that you launch the, the Sewers Compositor, it will ask you to set the path anyway. Uh, the S normals, I will turn this on just to smooth the normals. And that way you don't have any faceted polygons when you send it over. Uh, the RGB, I'm just going to keep this as as it is. And this is basically to be uh, the albedo to set it to RGB only, but I'm gonna leave it as it is. Uh, and the specular glossiness, this is the type of workflow. So when you send it to uh, Marmoset Toolback 4, it's going to use this PBR workflow. Um, I prefer to use the metal roughness, so I'm gonna click on that and change it. So just clicking once switches between metal roughness to um, yeah, specular glossiness. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna leave it to metal uh, roughness. And yeah, let's go ahead and click on Create Marmoset Toolback Composite. Click OK. Um, okay, so <laughs> if you get this this error, uh, this one right here that I have in as, a, as an extra subtool, it is indeed not a Polymesh 3D, so I'm gonna escape just to cancel that. Uh, let's just delete that. I don't know why I have that one there. All right, <laughs> let's do that again. All right, so now that I deleted the rest of the meshes here, they should be um, Polymer 3D anyway, so let's try that again. And here we go. So you'll see uh, the compositor goes through the process of producing a series of, of passes. Um, again, with different materials and different properties that at the end are going to be collected into a single material or a single shader inside Marmoset Toolback 4. Obviously, the, depending on the, on the size of the, the resolution that you choose, this process would take longer or not. Um, in my case, I didn't enable the SSS pass in the properties. So it's just telling me that you could not, well, the, the compositor could not find a render um, in the SSS pass. It doesn't matter. It's going to click outside and it continues with the process. If you want, um, you can totally enable the SSS um, switch in the render palette of the of ZBrush and you will produce an extra pass that you can use to uh, to manipulate things like the thickness and that sort of thing inside Marmoset. All right, I'm just going to give it a few more minutes just to complete this process. And it's done. Let me just bring in Marmoset and here we go. All right, so this is it. This is the the render uh, or the, the document in ZBrush all set up as a render and you see everything comes in a ZBrush composite uh, material. So by default, this is how it should look. So this plugin creates um, a UV plane and it creates a front camera. So in Marmoset, if I go ahead and go to cameras and click on main camera, you'll see that what actually happens is that there is a single plane. This one right here, if I enable uh, wireframe, you will be able to see that. And let's change the color to just white so you can see. So this is what it is. This is what the compositor does uh, behind the scenes in a way. So it just creates a, a plane and it uses the different passes or the different images to produce that sort of 3D, uh, 3D-ness of the, of the mesh. So right now, if I click on the material, uh, what's displacing or what's changing the, you know, the, the values here, or the, uh, giving it this volume is essentially this, the displacement map. So right now, you, all you can see is just a simple plane that has all the, uh, the materials applied to it. But the displacement is the one that is creating um, you know, the 3Dness of the creature. Obviously, this process has limitations. Um, you will basically have to create whatever you set up here as your camera angle is going to be what you see here. You can totally change the camera and just do something like this and do again the process and it will basically create the screenshots based on that um, camera angle. So um, it has its limitation, but it's still a pretty powerful workflow. Now, if you want to increase the resolution of what is being displayed, um, all you have to do, let's just, uh, let me just show you. If you select the plane, the actual plane, uh, by default, it's going to be locked. So I'm going to unlock it. And then I'm going to go to the subdivision here, click on subdivide, 
and you'll see it just does it automatically. I'm going to do it a couple more times. I'm going to turn off the, um, the wireframe. And you see now it's a little bit smoother. We can go for even one more level of subdivision. So uh, four levels of subdivision for that plane. All right. So that's pretty cool. Um, the, the details are being given by this uh, normal. And the normal is just the, the normal material inside ZBrush. This is the albedo. So I can turn this on and off. Right. Um, and I have the roughness and the metallic. So that's the that's the workflow that I chose. So it is set the the macro surface is set to roughness and the reflectivity is set to met metalness. So I'm going to take that and set it to zero. So there's no metallic going on and I can change the, the, the roughness to make it like super glossy or you know reflective or not. Um, other than that, we also have um, well, there's no emissiveness in this case, but you could if you wanted to. Um, and that's that can be used with the thickness map. So that's what I said. If you want to enable the SSS surface, you can use that and add a bit of um, emissiveness to you know to generate some some areas with <laughs> either with emissive or to exaggerate the SSS uh, pass. The ambient occlusion as well from ZBrush. Um, that's you know the ambient occlusion that you will see here. Um, there is a cavity map that you can use to accentuate the cavity. So I generally speaking, I take the diffuse cavity down a bit and increase the specularity cavity as well and that usually helps and the alpha is just the normal alpha uh, from ZBrush and that's the one that we're using to get rid of that um, you know background that yellow background it does a pretty good job right all right now the the reason ZBrush or this plugin creates a a front camera or a camera called front is because that's the camera that would match perfectly what you have here in your canvas so if I switch to camera front you see, you won't you won't see any distortion of that plane because it is using exactly the same angle that we use to export it or to or to send it here. So um, what I do, and this is just a personal preference, is to switch to the camera, right? And in the the latest version of Marmoset, you can actually split this in two. So I'm going to click on this icon, split in uh, vertical. In this case, will be fine, and that way I can work on one side and see the result on the other. So let's um, let's move this here. I'm going to click on camera front and this is what the the final render would look like when i click on the camera to access the settings here on the left hand side i want to click on set frame change the opacity um we can also actually go yeah i think this is fine you will see the the rendering here um and this one that has full quality i'm going to change this drop down so i'm going to leave the full quality to be the render and in here i'm just going to go for uh gray so that it just moves a little bit faster or render faster. Um, and let's go ahead and click on the sky and we can click on presets and I have it on my other side of the screen. Let me just bring that in. Okay. Uh, so these are just some presets from Marmoset. You can, you can actually download a bunch more. So I'm just going to filter by whatever, oh, whatever I have in my computer already. Click on that. Uh, let's go for something like this and let's click that. So now we have this environment that we can press the shift key and right click to rotate and you'll see because now this is like a yeah this is a 3d 3d plane uh, we will be able to see the the effect uh, let's turn on in the render palette i'm going to click on use ray tracing so now it gives us uh, a much better result and let's click again on this sky and i'm going to click somewhere here wherever there is light maybe here at the top right and that would create a new light so let's click on that light and let's also click on or just move that out, out of the way. Uh, if you don't see it is because again, uh, by default, it should, it should also turn the, the composite should also turn off the UI. So you can hold control and U and that would bring the, the UI. And this is the direction of the light. So I'm just going to rotate it a little bit. Uh, and just so that you can see the effect of this light, I'm going to push it quite a bit. So it's pretty strong but now you can see in, in the final render how it's look um how it looks and i just want to create some hard shadows in there uh, and maybe just maybe we can take the sky and turn it all the way down now if you do that just because the light is um is attached to the sky you'll basically <laughs> bring everything into darkness uh, but you can just take the the light out of the sky and then just work on 
on lights independently. So right now there's no influence from the sky because I just basically turned off the, the brightness, but you can just add a tiny bit just to bring those uh, dark areas into, into, the, into the render. And I'm gonna use these to change to a, a warmer tone like that. Um, we can also right click on that, on that um, light and duplicate it. And I'm gonna move it to the other side. And let's go ahead and rotate around. So this is gonna be kind of like a fill light coming from the right hand side. And this is gonna be more of a cooler tone like that. So you see all the effect of the light, what's happening here as well as in the render. Um, another thing that you can do is change the diameter so that the, the shadow that is produced by this is not as strong. So just basically diffusing that light or changing the size of that source. Um, also, just because of the type of dramatic render that I'm going for, I'm gonna select the sky and I'm gonna change the color here in the backdrop. So I'm gonna click on color, set it to just pure black, like so. And that's pretty much it. Now, for those um, who are interested in those kind of like glowing things or how I did that in that example that I showed you earlier, um, I'm gonna just right click and duplicate this light, right? So it's exactly the same thing. Here's the light, uh, but I'm gonna change the type from directional to spot and, not oh, sorry, not spot, to omni. There we go. And let's just gonna, let's just place this somewhere in here in the eye. And you might have to change the intensity or the brightness and, you know, just make it a yellow, reddish tone. There we go. Um, and again, let's right click, duplicate, send it to the other eye. All right. So now we can go ahead and see our final render on how it's looking. Uh, of course, you can play around with other stuff in the material itself. So for instance, if you have something like in this case, a bunch of bones, um, you could change the transmission and add a volumetric scattering, for example. So now you have uh, a bit of scattering happening. And if you don't see the, the effect or if the effect is too strong, you have to check the scale of the scene. So I'm gonna click on this gear icon, show scale of the scene, and it's quite tiny, these little um, human reference. So I can go to the scene and let's type point, point zero 0.05 maybe. Yeah, that should be all right. So you'll see that now it kind of like matches the scale a little bit better. I'll turn this off. Uh, so we just need to compensate and go back to these lights. There we go. Uh, but then now the, the, sc the scattering or the volumetric scattering should work a little bit better. I'm going to exaggerate it just so you can see what it does. So it gives you that really nice uh, subsurface scattering in, a, in, in that 3D um, mesh. Uh, but, it, you know, this is what it's amazing about this workflow is that this is just a plane. <laughs> but we're taking advantage of that 3Dness of that displacement from ZBrush. I'm just going to leave it like this just to give it a, an extra thing. Um, and, of course, there's a lot of other things that you can use to, um, to tweak the render. But I think this is looking pretty good. Um, maybe give it a bit more of a reflection just by tweaking the, the roughness. And like I said, you can make it metallic if you wanted to, right? Um, but yeah, this is pretty much it. Hopefully this process has been of help. Um, just to sum it all up, because um, I gave you like a lot of steps, but it is actually really, really simple. All you have to do is in ZBrush, create whatever you want. You don't have to worry about anything other than making a, a cool concept. Forget about the technicalities. Uh, you can even send fiber mesh as well. So you create whatever you want in here, then change the document to a to a square. Um, these numbers, they don't really matter. Uh, you just need to focus on the resolution here and then click on send to uh, or create toolbar composite. And there you go, you will be in this mode already. So pretty easy set of steps. Just wanted to give you uh, a rundown of the entire workflow. Uh, like I said, I might do another tutorial where I cover the, the Substance 3D Painter um, process, which is very similar. It's just a different, slightly different workflow, but it's, it's more about painting and, and texturing. So totally, totally awesome tool as well. All right. So I'm going to leave this tutorial here and I will see you in the next video. Cheers.